So welcome to Wine and Wisdom for this week. This week is Parashat Kiteitze, and the title of this week's class is How Humility Keeps You High, Recognizing Your Limits is the Secret to True Growth. And um, before we get started, we always like to start by making a bracha on our wine, so please join me in raising a glass. And if you're drinking wine, please make a bracha together with me. Baruch, Ata, Adonai, Rehinu, Melech, Ha'olam, Borei, Amen. Amen. And um, as always, before we start the class, we like to do a little partial <coughs> overview. So what is this week's partial? What is Ki say all about? Um, so, oh, and, and tonight's class is sponsored by uh, Phil Wershba and uh, his beautiful wife, Sanya, in honor of the, uh, the rabbi who gives the class each week. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's, a, uh, that's an attempt to keep you humble, considering. Yes. <laughs> uh, didn't want to mention okay. his name. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, Ron, if we can ask you, please, to read for us the Parsha overview. Um, and and uh, this week's Parsha is the record breaking Parsha of the most mitzvahs in one Parsha. Um, so, it might be a little bit of a longer overview. So, go ahead. All right, 74 of this Torah's 613 commandments, mitzvot, are in the Parsha of Ki Tetzi. These include the laws of the beautiful captive, the inheritance rights of the firstborn, the wayward and rebellious son, burial and dignity of the dead, returning a lost object, sending away the, the mother bird before taking her young, the duty to erect a safety fence around the roof of one's home, and the various forms of kill. Kiliyim, forbidden plant and animal hybrids. Also recounted are the judicial procedures and the penalties for adultery, for the rape or seduction of an unmarried girl, for a husband who falsely accuses his wife of infidelity. The following cannot marry a person of Jewish lineage, a a mamzer, someone born from an adulterous or incestuous relationship, a male of Moabite or Ammonite descent, a first or second generation Edomite or Egyptian. Okay, and let's keep going. (laughs) Our Parsha also includes laws governing the purity of the military camp, the prohibition against turning in an escaped slave, the duty to pay a worker on time and to allow anyone working for you, human or animal, to eat on the job, the proper treatment of an of a debtor and the prohibition against charging interest on a loan, the laws of divorce from which are also de- derived from many of the laws of marriage, the penalty of 39 lashes for tra- transgression, transgression of a Torah prohibition and the procedures for yib, yibam, leverite marriage, of the wife of a deceased to his childless brother or kal, kalitza, removing of the soul, of the shoe, in the case that their brother in law does not wish to marry her. Okay, so we got a little bit of a long list of mitzvahs that there are in this week's parsha. For those of you that like to, to follow along when we read the Torah in Shul, with the Kol Menachem Chomish, the orange one, um, or if you have that at home, you can see at the back, here I go, right here. at the back of each parsha, they usually have a tally of how many mitzvahs there are in this week's parsha and what they are, and at the back of this week's parsha, we have the 74 mitzvahs listed in this week's parsha. Take a look at how long it is. Mm. That's the list. So sometimes there's like one or two, you know? And this is, uh, that's the, the list this week. Either way, <clears throat> the topic of tonight's class is going to, how is it that great people do such disastrously low things? What I mean is, I'd like to open up by, by, by reminding each of you, I mean, you, we all know the story, right? You wake up in the morning, I don't know what your morning routine is, and wh- at what point the news enters your day, maybe it's you turn on the television, maybe the television had been off the night before, maybe you get in the car, you turn on the radio, maybe you flip through your phone for the news, maybe you open a newspaper like this woman in this, uh, in this photo, uh, but either way, and we read about some latest celebrity or politician or governor of New York or whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> that somehow seems to be someone in such a great position, and so famous, so this, so that, so so super. By the way, that, that Lahavdil, this also happens, unfortunately, sometimes with uh, spiritual leaders. 
right? You, you read about a particular rabbi or whatever it is, right? And you hear that this person was caught doing such, such disastrous things, or they fell to some major challenge or major uh, uh, temptation, and you're like, what? How does such a thing happen? Um, so today, I'd like to try to address that. Um, and specifically, we're going to do so by, by uh, we're, we're going to anchor that conversation in one of the mitzvahs, one of the 74 mitzvahs, which, which Ron mentioned as part of the laundry list that we did just before, um, uh, in this week's parasha, which is to build a fence around your roof. Okay, so let's start with the pesukim, let's start with the verses. Phil? When you build a new house, you shall make a guardrail for your roof, so that you shall not cause blood to be spilled in your house. When the one who falls should fall from it. The roof. So uh, the Torah tells us that if you build a house, you own a house, you have a roof, that roof someone can fall from, you have to make sure to put a guardrail around it. Fairly straightforward, right? Um, as Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ovadia Seforno, that's 1B. The Seforno explains. Go ahead, uh, uh, Phil. So that you shall not cause blood to be spilled in your house. If someone were to fall, make sure that you are not in any way at fault, so that bloodshed not be attributed to your home. Okay, fairly straightforward, right? You got to be responsible about what's going on in your in, inside your house, and you you got to make sure that that if that if you have a roof, no one is going to fall from it. Um, the Talmud extends this law and says that it's actually not just about a roof, and it's not just about someone falling; it's about any up ob- any obstacle, any. Uh, Dangerous item in your house. Brett, are you with us? You want to read text two? I'm not with us. What, what was that? I'm not with us. Okay. Ah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, this law applies whether it is a roof of any dangerous thing liable to cause a fatal accident. For example, if someone has an empty pit in his courtyard, he must make a wall 10 uh, tefahim uh, tall around it or to make a cover for it, uh, so that a person does not fall into it and die. Okay, so uh, if it's a pit, if it has water in it, or if it doesn't have water in it, right? This is very reminiscent actually of some California state laws that we have till today. Like for instance, in California, you may know, that the California law actually requires you that if you have a pool at home, this wasn't always the law, but recently it's become the law. If you have a, a pool at home, you must build a fence around the pool. The pool must be, the, 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 the fence must be five feet tall. I'm quoting California law now. It has to have four inch or less gaps um, uh, between, like if you're going to have, I guess, uh, horizontal slats or, or even vertical slats, there would be less than four inch uh, gaps between the, uh, the, the slats. And if it's horizontal gaps or, or even if it's just a fence, there has to be less than two inches from the bottom of the fence to the floor. These are, this is California law. Another law is that the door has to be self-closing, right? We don't need to wait until there are, there are some disastrous stories. Someone falls into the pool, a child falls into the pool and, and, and drowns, chas v'shalom, heaven forbid, right? We've all read stories like that in the news. We're not interested in making the next story. So we have to put a fence around our, our pool. And this, this law is found in the Torah, in this week's Torah portion. Okay? Interesting. Um, the launch point of our class, though, today is not, not generally this law, but actually, it's, it's not like the substance of how much it applies and whether, whether it's just a, a roof or if it applies to other things. But actually, there are a couple of details about this mitzvah that are very, very curious. So before performing most mitzvahs in general, we're supposed to make a bracha, right? So before you blow the shofar, before you put on tefillin, we all know this, right? Before we put on tefillin every morning, we make a bracha. Before we, uh, whatever it is, right? Before we eat matzah, before we shake a lulav, we make a bracha. So it turns out that the Rambam tells us that the same thing applies to this mitzvah. Go ahead. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, I think I give it to someone. Uh, Marilyn, if you can read for us, please, text 3a. When one makes a guardrail, the following blessing is recited while constructing it. Who has sanctified us with your commandments and commanded us to construct a guardrail? Okay, now this would all be fine and dandy, except for one detail, okay? That detail is that Rambam elaborates somewhere else that there, that every, and we're gonna, we're, we're, you know what, let's start with that quote and then I'll explain. Uh, Marilyn, this would all be fine and dandy, except that the Rambam tells us elsewhere in his, in his Maimonides and his Mishnah Torah that, 
Okay. Blessings are not recited over an obligation that was instituted because of a danger. Okay. So allow me to elaborate. Many of the mitzvahs that we do are spiritual in nature, right? So we, um, we blow a shofar. I don't, obviously there's lots of reasons given. We're crowning God as king. We're returning. We're doing teshuva. But inherently, it's a spiritual mitzvah. It's a ritual that God gave us. I tell him, same thing, right? Yeah, I get it. We're giving over our thoughts and our emotions. Shabbat candles. I get it. We're bringing light into the world and we're beginning Shabbat and we're bringing holiness into our home. It, it's all beautiful. But inherently, the, the, besides the explanations, it's a spiritual, ritualistic mitzvah that we're doing for Hashem. So we make a bracha, right? A blessing to draw down that spiritual energy into the world. That's actually the idea behind the blessing, to initiate the spiritual energy. Great. There are some mitzvahs, however, that go into a category of what's called sakana, which means th th there's something that the Torah is trying to protect you from, literally a physical danger that the Torah is trying to protect you from. And that seems to be what the mitzvah of Micah, the mitzvah of putting up a fence around your, your room, that's what it seems to be all about. Now, let me show you one place where the, and, and, and when it comes to, uh, to, to mitzvahs that are all about danger, just preventing danger, those mitzvahs, we usually don't make a blessing on it. It's not, it's not a spiritual energy, energy, energy that we need to draw down. So we don't make a bracha. That's usually the rule. Let me show you one place where you see the contrast of this very starkly. Every Friday night, well, really any meal that we have, but let's just go with Friday night. Friday night, we're sitting at the Shabbat table. Before we, we finish Kiddush, before we eat challah, we... Anybody? Yeah, bracha. Right, but before the bracha? Wash hands. We wash our hands. Yep, we wash our hands. Now, when we wash, we wash our hands, we make a bracha. Okay, why is that? Now, the full blessing, remember, is, Baruch atah, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments, very spiritual, and commanded us to wash our hands. Why are we doing this? Because, without getting into all the details, it's a spiritual concept. Okay. Washing our hands before a meal is a spiritual concept. Now, we also wash our hands after the meal. Is everybody familiar with this? Right before Birkat HaMazon, we take a little bit of water. It's called Mayim Achronim, which means the after meal waters. We take a little bit and we pour it on our hands. Now, the re if you're not familiar with it, with this, one, the, one of the reasons why you wouldn't be familiar with this is because it's not such a to-do at the table. We don't all get up, go to the kitchen and wash our hands. Instead, they pass around a little cup. You pour a little bit over your fingers. You're good to go. You move along. What is this washing? This washing, we actually don't make a bracha on. We don't make any bracha on it at all. And actually, the reason why we wash our hands after the meal, why is that, Arnold? You want to say? No. Um, why we, we make it after the meal? Why, why do we wash our hands after the meal? Anybody familiar? I don't know. So the idea of washing our hands after the meal is actually more of a danger issue. Okay, historically it comes from something called the sodomite salt. Okay, so salt, there was this salt that was very, very potent. It came from the city of, of Sodom. Uh -huh. And for whatever reason, I guess people were worried that during the, during the meal, they might have gotten some of that salt onto their fingers. And if that fingers, if, I guess if it goes into your eyes or, if it go, or if, even if it stays on your fingers, it can be harmful to you. So therefore we wash our hands. That's what it says in Shulchan Aruch. That's what it says in Jewish Bible. Now this, this sodomite salt is actually not found. Uh, uh, that, that, it's not that common in today's day and age. But still, the custom remains. Okay. Um, by the way, this is actually, um, you, you know, today we're all uh, amateur epidemiologists, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and we know that, that there's a couple things here. First of all, washing your hands is one of the things you can do. If you're going to do one thing to stay safe, washing your hands is one of the things you can do. Right? right from COVID and really from anything. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love that only because of COVID we wash our hands. But uh, as soon as COVID is done, we're all going right back, to <laughs> just filtering ourselves. And no, on a serious note, right? We, we wash our hands. It's one of the things we, as we know in today's day and age, one of the things that we can do to make sure that we stay safe. Um, there's actually a uh, fascinating story about this. It goes back to a doctor whose name was Semmelweis. 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 How does it go, Phil? Semmelweis. That's right. the way I've heard it. Right. And, and you familiar with the story? I, he, he, yes. he was a doctor. He was the first doctor who basically realized that us washing our hands often, that, that, that specifically medical professionals washing their hands um, uh, could save lives. And he actually saved countless lives because of that, because he used to make his doctors in his ward um, dip their fingers into what? Some sort of solution? I forgot what it was. Yeah, it was a, some chemical solution. I forgot. So what, what century was that, by the way? 
I don't remember. You can look it up. Um, someone, it's a pretty famous story because basically he noticed that he had two wards for women giving birth. One was overseen by doctors and the mm. other one was overseen by um, midwives. And there was a, a disease called child, ch childbirth something, maybe childbirth fever. Yeah, childbirth fever. Or You've heard of this before, Marilyn? Before, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It was very common. All of the women, like it was like 90% of the women who were in, hi, Marty, good to see you. <laughs> um, all of the women who were giving birth in the, in the doctor's ward were getting this disease and about 90% of them were dying in his, in his medical facility. And in, uh, of the midwives, like one in, I don't know, whatever, would, would get it. And he really wasn't sure what was causing it. And he, he really couldn't figure it out until he finally one day realized that the doctors would start their day by conducting the, uh, the autopsies. Auto, I was looking for the word. For, they would start the day by conducting the autopsies. They could, when they would conduct the autopsies, they would get a certain bacteria on their fingers, which right. was coming from the bodies, and then they would then move along to help the women um, um, in childbirth, and then they would, uh, at least very often, if not most of the time, um, transfer that, that bacteria. And anyways, we really went off topic here. I, I think it was in a time where it was before people were aware that there were microscopes. Right, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Being so it was before that, but he figured it out before it was even. Actually, from what I understand, during his lifetime, he it was not very well accepted. The the the, the no, it wasn't. A, a lot of people poo pooed him. him. Yep. A lot of people made made fun of his theory. Except it's only today that we know that he he was really onto something that was way ahead of his time. In any event, back to the conversation we have at hand here. So the reason we're washing our hands, right, is because we know we touch our faces often, right? There was that great. Uh, video of that great meme going around of the woman, some local health health professional woman in some some town, or whatever, last year with COVID, that she was making an announcement about how important it is to wash your hands, not touch your face. This is before any lockdowns, and even during the speech, she touched her face like ten times, and maybe I think licked her fingers in order to turn the page or whatever. You know? <laughs> so we know how difficult it is. So that's why we wash our hands at the end of a meal in order to get rid of this sodomite salt. Now here's the deal: in the same meal. At the beginning, when we wash our hands, we make a blessing because it's more of a ritual. It's more of a spiritual concept. And at the end, because it's just a danger issue, we don't make any blessing at all. Why? So putting a drop on your hands isn't going to clean your hands at the end of a meal. Well, it's, it's today, symbolic, I well, guess. Correct. I think today it's more symbolic. There are also Kabbalistic sides to that, to that, to that, uh, to that ritual. But let's leave that as it is. My point is that when it comes to, and the, by the way, there's reasons given for this. One of the reasons that are given is that it's not a suitable act to make a blessing on. If you're, if you're like in a state of anxiety and, and, and worried about some sort of danger, and that's why you're doing this mitzvah, whatever it is, whether it's building a fence or if it's uh, washing your hands in order to avoid, whatever, whatever it is that there's a mitzvah that you're doing in order to avoid danger, Blessings are supposed to be on joyous and uplifting occasions, not, you know, uh, acts that exist because of negative reasons. That's one of, one of the explanations given for why we don't make a blessing on something, on a, on a mitzvah that's only made to avoid danger. So the question now becomes, so hold on a second. If that's the case, then why are we making a blessing when we build a fence around our home? Yeah. Question number two. Um, Marilyn, you were in the middle of reading first, right? So text yes, first. Yes. Text four. Okay. New rabbi says you must make a fence from when the house is made anew. So you may have noticed that in the verse, it doesn't just say you should build a fence. It says, chadash. When you build a new home, then you have to put a fence around, around, around the top of your, 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 your home. So Ron, hold on a second. If you rent from me or if you buy my current home, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's got a very dangerous roof. No need to put a fence. People can die all they want. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is going on up here? What's with the new? So the Sifri explains, and that's what uh, um, uh, Marilyn, Marilyn was just quoting for us, that actually the obligation to build a fence is immediately upon purchase or completion of a building. Okay, so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be building close, it could also be um, um, uh, purchasing. But the point that the Torah is trying to make here by saying when you build a new house 
is to say that even if you're not living in it yet, even if nobody's living in it yet, but you own the property, as soon as you own a property that has a roof that needs, needs a fence around it, you got to put a fence. Yeah. Even if you haven't moved in yet, even if you're going to move in in 30 days. By the way, this is even more strict than the Mitzvah and Mitzvah. Mitzvah and Mitzvah, you get a little bit of leeway time. Anyways, but leaving that, leaving that aside for now. So hold on a second. Why does the Torah tell us in, this, in these strange words? If you build a new house, then you have to put a gate. And we have to learn out of this that this means that you should do it as soon as the, the house is ready for the... What does that mean? Why can't it just say, when you buy a new house? Right? Or when you buy a house? What's with the word new? What does that mean? What's with the building of a new house? So to summarize, we have two questions here. Number one, why, we, why, we, why would we recite a blessing for something that's only for protection? But normally we don't. And number two, why does the Torah specific, specifically refer to a new house? Okay. Everybody with us so far? Yes. Okay. So a recurring idea in our, in our Torah classes is that the Torah is comprised of many, many layers, right? Um, there are lessons for our daily lives. There is history. There, is the, there are legalities. There are uh, uh, you know, all, all, different, all different aspects of the Torah and all different ways of looking at the Torah. There's the, the literal side to the Torah, the spiritual side to the Torah, etc. cetera. Um, one of the cool things that Hashem does in the Torah um, by the way, just as Hashem really does with the entire world, as we'll talk about later, is that in some cases, there's a question that arises from the literal text in the Torah, but it can only adequate, be adequately addressed, can only really properly be answered once you understand the spiritual side of the Torah or the spiritual explanation of that verse. This is done on purpose. Um, the reason that Hashem does this is because He wants us to recognize that there's more to the Torah than meets the eye. So if we'd be able to go through the entire Torah and understand it on a literal level without any need to go to, go to the spiritual plane, then we would say, all right, that's it, there is to the Torah. But in order to every once in a while kind of hint to the deeper side of the Torah, every once in a while the only way to understand this is by going, to the, is, is by going is by digging a little deeper. And that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to see that this verse and this mitzvah and all the questions that we just gave are going to become entirely understood once we understand the Torah on a little bit more of a, of a deeper, deeper level, okay? This louder. Everybody with us? Yep. Yep. So what is the mitzvah of putting up a fence? It actually happens to be a profound spiritual significance of putting up a fence around your roof. It turns out that humans are vulnerable. <laughs> Physically, we are, of course, mortal, right? We all, we all die at some point. Um, we never take good health uh, for granted. But it's also, spiritually speaking, no matter how much we have grown, no matter what level we have reached, we forever run the risk of falling, falling off the roof, so to speak. Let's turn to text five, which is a, a fascinating um, lesson that the Talmud gives us with a very, very uh, uh, direct um, uh, precedent. Uh, Arnold, if you can read for us, please, text uh, five. Do not be sure of yourself until the day you die, as Yohanan, the high priest, served in the high priesthood for 80 years and ultimately became a Sadducee. So a Sadducee, as many of you might remember, is someone who um, believes only in Torah, Torah Shabbat, only in the written Torah and not in, not in, the, in, the, uh, in the Torah Shabbat. Uh, I believe we once had a full, not in the oral Torah. Um, I believe we once had a full class, particularly talking about the Kohen Gadols of the Second Temple era. Is that correct? I remember. And how, and how many of them there were? Because they were dying every single year. Does everybody, does everybody remember this? No. Because they weren't doing the service properly. Mm -hmm. They were dying once a year. Because these people were coming in to try to, to, to try to corrupt the way the service in the temple was supposed to be done. The thing is that on Yom Kippur, if uh, a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, did the service incorrectly and he went into the Holy of Holies, he wouldn't come out alive. That's oh. why they would put a chain around their, around their body, right? And, in, uh, and then they would have to shut him out. So here's the deal. Um... This Rabbi Yochanan Kohen Gadol was a Kohen Gadol for 80 years, which means that every single year he went into the Holy of Holies, he did, he did the service properly, and everything was fine and dandy. Not only that, I would venture to say it was more than fine and dandy. It meant his for, the forgiveness was accepted on behalf of the Jewish people. It meant he was a tzaddik. It meant he was doing the, the, the holiest uh, uh, service in the temple and doing it properly. Mm -hmm. And then one year, how does he die? One year, he turned, he, he, he turned uh, away, away from the Torah. He became a Sadducee. And in that year, he died. 
Here's the question. And, and so the Talmud uses him as an example for saying, never, you should never fully take your spiritual, spiritual status for granted. You can't, you know, work for years on becoming a tzaddik and then say, all right, now I've entered cruise control and I can just let go and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because look at Rabbi Yochanan Kohenado. For 80 years, he was a fine, upstanding fellow. And then he fell from grace. Mm-hmm. So he doubted a, himself. A great, it's a great anecdotal example. The question is, what happened? What happened to Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan Kohen Gadol? How, or, to go back to the question with which we started our class, how does somebody, right? We're not just talking about governors of New York that maybe they were corrupt all along, just we didn't know, right? There are people out there that actually for many years are proper upstanding people. And then one day, boom, they slip up majorly. They give in to their temptation. Or they question their interpretation. Or what? Or they question their understanding. You're saying they lose faith. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the question is, does this mean that, let's say, if, let's say if they were serving for 50 years in a position of leadership or whatever it is, does that mean that those 50 years were really all just a big farce? No. So then what happened? He got old. <laughs> he got old. Okay. I can't argue with this. He got senile. <laughs> I cannot argue with this because everybody in this class is older than me. I don't know what I, you know, I don't know he what it's forgot. like. He forgot. <laughs> but what I can do is I can offer an alternate explanation. The Alter Rebbe and Tanya, right? The first Chavad Rebbe and Tanya famously introduces the two soul doctrine, right? Oh, yeah. That every single one of us is made up of two souls, a nefesh alokit, a nefesh Muhammad, a godly soul, and an animal soul. And that those two souls are constantly fighting, fighting for, 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 uh, for power over, over our lives, for lack of a better word, right? For influence over what, we're going, what decision we're going to make in each situation. Are we going to listen to our animal soul and do the wrong thing or are we, and uh, fall for temptation? Or are we going to listen to our godly soul and, uh, and uh, you know, whatever it is, right? Give tzedakah and uh, daven and learn and, and pray and all, all, all the sorts of amazing things that we're supposed to do. So the al Rebbe writes that here's the deal. Because you have two souls, in other words, one of the implications of the fact that you have two souls is that just because you've been in tune with one soul for many, many years, doesn't mean the other soul is not there. You haven't gotten rid of that soul. That soul is still there and still trying with temptation. Just you happen to be acing every challenge as, as you're going through it. You're on a good streak. But because it's still there at any given moment, it can, it can flare up. And that's why we always have to be vigilant and mindful of who's in charge. Let's see how the author ever writes this in Tanya. Ron, if you can read for us, please. Let me pull the text back up. Text 6a. Yet, inasmuch as the evil in the hearts, in the hearts left part of the Benonim remains with its innate strength, craving after the pleasures of this world, one should not consider oneself immune and should not accept the world's opinion, which would have him believe that the evil in him has been dissolved by the good, which is the rank of the Zadok. Rather, in his own estimation, he should consider himself as if the evil is at full strength in the left part as from birth, and that nothing of it has ceased or departed. On the contrary, with the passing of time, it has gained strength because the person has indulged, indulged it considerably in eating and in drinking and other mundane pursuits. Each one, uh, each one whose whole aspiration is in God's Torah, which he studies day and night for its own sake, this is still no proof that the evil has been dislodged from its place. Rather, it may still be that its essence and substance are at full force. So it turns out that just because outwardly a person looks like, and not by, by outwardly, I don't just mean in front of other people, even outwardly to oneself. In other words, in thought, speech, and action, okay, which is pretty darn good, by the way. For 50 years, a person is, is behaving properly, is uh, all of his thought, speech, and action are in line with God, which is what we would call a tzaddik. The al Rebbe says, that's just his thought, speech, and action. And it's very possible that he still has evil within him. And actually, it's, it, it makes it more impressive that, he, that, he, that all of his thought, speech, and action for the past 50 years have been in line with God. However, here's the catch. The evil is still within him because he hasn't gotten rid of that. 
Now that's not a problem. The only thing it is, is a reminder that we need to stay vigilant always. Now, the altar uses this, by the way, and then I'll ask you to read 6b, to explain an interesting question which the altar asks in chapter one, in the opening of Tanya. Okay, so some of you may have learned Tanya before, but I'll, I'll summarize it just in case. And what we're going to quote now is actually from chapter 13, where the altar finally answers it. What's the question? The question is, there was a great sage whose name was Rabbah. And he used to go around saying, I am, an, I am a, a Benoni. In other words, I'm an in-betweener. I'm a middleman. I'm, I'm, I'm no tzaddik. So I'm no holy man. I'm no Russia. I'm no, uh, uh, you know, wicked man. But I am also... I'm also no tzaddik. I'm also, I'm also no rising. I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. And the Alter Rebbe writes that this was actually a tactic of Rabbas. The Alter Rebbe's question is, how could such a holy man say that he was only a, a, an in-betweener, like a, a medium, a, a medium a, a, you know, a, a, an intermediate uh, uh, man? And uh, why is he not a tzaddik? What is that tzaddik? Look at how much he used to pray and how much he used to do, study Torah and how much he used to do mitzvahs. So the Alter Rebbe explains that it turns out that just because all of his actions were aligned with God, that does not mean that he wasn't worried about his nefesh Bahamis, about his animal soul at any point flaring up and gaining control. And actually the fact that he used to view himself for real, truly as an, an intermediate was specifically to remain vigilant. Go ahead, Ron, 6B. But in an intermediate person, it is by way of example, similar to a sleeping man who can awaken from his sleep. So is the evil in the intermediate person dormant, as it were in the left part of the heart during the recital of the Shema and the prayer Amida, when his heart is aglow with the love of God, but later it can, awake, it can wake up again. For this reason, Rabbah considered himself as though he were a Benanim, though his mouth never ceased from study and his desires, desire was in God's Torah day and night, with the passionate craving and longing of a soul yearning for God with overwhelming love, such as experienced when reciting Shema and the Amida. Hence, he appeared in his own eyes like an ordinary person who prays all day. So this is a very powerful uh, lesson, by the way. Rabbi is a man who, despite being at a very high elevated spiritual status, meaning by, by, what I, by high elevated spiritual status, what I mean is, I've got a bracha. <laughs> Bore, pre, I got him. I mean, um, by very high elevated status, what I mean is that he was studying Torah all day and praying all day and all that sort of stuff. And he never let that for a minute. He never let that get to him. What do I mean? He always viewed himself as a baby because he was like, who knows? Maybe, right? Humans are vulnerable. And maybe today is the day that I'm going to slip up. So I got to always be vigilant and always remember that I'm no tzaddik. Mm -hmm. I still have evil within me, even if, even if I'm not allowing it to function, I still have evil within me. Or in other words, the lesson for us is you can never feel overly confident of your spiritual state because we forever run the risk of falling. And actually, by the way, we say this every day in our prayers. Phil, text seven, please. Bring us not to sin, neither to transgression, nor a fall from grace. May we never be test after face, nor <laughs> ever come to disgrace. Now, I, I will point something out. Um, there's a partnership, right? We don't just wake up every morning and say, God, you please don't give me any temptation to sin, and then I won't sin. And then we go about doing whatever we want to do, and if uh, God gives us, the, gives us the temptation, then now we have every right to sin, because we gave a disclaimer in the morning. <laughs> don't, don't, don't give me a temptation. That doesn't work that way, right? There is a partnership. But that partnership is actually very, very powerful. On the one hand, we ask God, listen, don't tempt me. I, I'm not so sure, I'm not so arrogant that I believe that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that, that I'm never going to sin. Even if I've been studying Torah for a very long time, even if I, don't put me in such a situation. I don't want, I don't want temptation. Now, then we go about our lives and we have to make sure and, and put, it, put, it, put measures in place like, like that should we be tempted, we shouldn't fall. And this is where the mitzvah of Micah comes in. Protective measures in our lives are a very, very healthy thing. Um, obviously, this is going to be subjective to every person. Every person has to realize what the risky areas in their life are. You know, for some people, peer pressure, or peer pressure, and social environments are like the big, uh, the big, the big issue. You know, and they and they got to make sure that they put some sort of protective measure in place that, that they don't put themselves in a situation with peer pressure. You know, if they're going to go to a party where they feel it's going to be negative. Uh, 
actions being done, and, and for them, peer pressure is a very big deal. They say, ah, come on, do it together, everybody. If, if that's something that, that's very hard for you, you obviously have to make sure that you don't end up in a situation where there's a lot of peer pressure, right? For other people, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's relationships in the workplace, right? That having a particular relationship with a particular coworker, you feel might lead to X, Y, and Z, okay? So then now you, have, you know you have to be very, very careful, right? Uh, I think the former vice president became famous for what he called the Mike Pence rule, I think it was. I forgot exactly his rule, but I, I, I think he would never be in a room <sighs> alone together with a woman. I don't remember the exact details. Either way, the point is, he felt that this was, you know, and he, he would make sure that it, and, and he, yeah, by the way, he's 100% right, right? Nobody can come to him. If, if you have a rule like that, you're never in a, in a room alone together with a woman, then not only can you never come to do anything wrong, but nobody can ever accuse you of doing anything wrong, which is also a big epidemic that we have now in today's society, right? Women lying and saying, and saying things. Yes, Phil? I just want to point out that Mike Pence was excoriated for that. For the wrong reason, they said, well, that means that uh, he can't mentor a woman, you know, uh, won't give her a chance. Just that's the way the world works, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. A man who does something for, for, for all, anyways, whatever, yeah. Look, the fact is he's still in politics, and no matter what he does, you know, even if he if he used to put on tefillin every day and uh, <laughs> exactly. pray to God for six hours, those on the other side of politics of him would make sure to, 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 uh, to demonize him. So whatever it is. But, I, but you my, know, it's very common that um, doctors, when they're examining a woman, um, they have a, a, someone else in the room. With yes, them. I did know that. I did know that, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I've experienced uh, um, that. Which, which is A, sad, that that's the reality of our world, that that's the way things need to be. But on the other hand, maybe also just human nature, you know? That's what human beings are, and therefore we have to take precautions to make sure. So my point is that for each person, it's subjective. Whatever well, you know, if, if someone was with Joseph when he was, when Potiphar, was that her name? Potiphar. No, Potiphar was, was her husband. His wife. His wife. Oh, his wife, Potiphar's wife. If someone was there with Joseph, he could have been protected. Almost that right, that's and, and, and that's actually the point that I was making earlier, because Joseph actually didn't do anything with her, right. No. right? But he was accused of doing something with her because he was alone with her, right? which, which I guess really wasn't his choice because he was a slave. But still, yep, you, you make a very valid point. Um, and I'll give one more example, by the way, which I think today is an example that almost everybody can relate with. Um, you know, some people are affected by things um, like, like uh, whether it's entertainment or if it's a news, right? We read certain things in the news. Uh, uh, we listen to certain things on the, on the radio. Pessimistic reporting, whether it's about, about about religion and Judaism, right? Cynical reporting about Judaism, that kind of thing. I mean, we or we watch something, a TV show that, that that has like a negative portrayal of Judaism, right? And that I think today is something that's very, very, very uh, uh, common. That 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 we're we're all, we're all affected by what we read and what we watch and what we see, etc. And there's nothing wrong with putting certain boundaries in place and saying, this is not for me. You know, the world has a saying, you can't unsee that, right? Whatever it is, right? You can't unthink something. If somebody plants an idea in your brain because they choose to plant something in your brain, right? You have to be very strong, whatever it is, right? Now, the reason I say it's, it's such a common thing is because this, this was actually one of, the, one, of, one of the discussions at my table this past uh, Shabbat, uh, Friday, the, the Friday night dinner table, this past Shabbat, um, we we're having a conversation about news. The news has become, for better or for worse, very, very psychologically disturbing. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, in, in two ways, both simple news, you know, unfortunately, right now, there's a lot of terrible things going on in the world. My art goes out to people in Afghanistan, to people right. in Haiti. And, and, and by the way, three months ago, there were, there were probably other people. I, I don't even remember the news cycle works so quickly, who it is at every moment that we're... That, and in addition to that, there's politics, which... Every time you turn on any political, uh, uh, new, even just news, right? You turn on KX or you turn on whatever it is, right? Whichever side of the other. The news is presented in such a way that they're always demonizing one side, right? So that, that can have a very strong psychologically damaging effect on a person's brain. And at the, at the Shabbat dinner table, we were talking about what's the way, I always keep politics away from the table. So we, this was very apolitical. And I, I actually happen to know that the two couples that were there were on two opposite sides of the spectrum when it came to... Uh, to, to political views. But they were both worried about the same thing. We, I mean, in other words, we were having a very simple conversation about, so what do you do? You can't not listen to the news. You, could, you should definitely, we should definitely minimize it. 
which, mm-hmm. which, which has unfortunately become very, very difficult because they convince you, you turn, you turn on the news, they convince you that, oh, you got to be watching all the time. If you're not watching all the time, you're going to miss something because obviously that's how they keep you watching and that's how they keep getting making money off of you, right? But my point is that for some people, that's the, uh, the, the place where protective measures are needed, right? Well, you have to protect yourself. You have to learn you, how to discern you have to, and, and to identify. You have to discern, but you also have to learn how to set boundaries. And this is where it t- ties right into this mitzvah. You have to learn how to put up a fence till we're and we're not. I, I was about to share another example, but you know what? Let's dive right into the example they have here in the class. Um, uh, Brad, you ready to read with us or not, or not yet? Let me get my glasses. Uh. So while you Let get your back, okay, right, okay. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, all right. Go around, go around, and do not approach the vineyard. They tell the Nazar. Uh, Brett, do you know what a Nazir is? A Nazarite? Um, that's the bridge of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> a Nazarite, a Nazir, is someone who swears off of cutting his hair and, um, and drinking wine and a few other things. So the Talmud says that we tell a Nazir, who's not allowed to drink wine, go around, or words, take the longer route, and don't go through the vineyard because you'll be tempted to drink wine. Right? As Maimonides elaborates. Go ahead, Brett. Text 8b. Oh, there's more. Okay. All right. According to rabbinic decree, it is forbidden for a Nazir to abide amidst a gathering of people drinking wine. Instead, he should separate himself far from them because they are they present they present a hurdle for him so the rambam tells us that for a nazir who, who has sworn off of drinking wine and is uh, now uh, uh uh bound by torah law not to drink wine it's so the rabbis in order to protect him may put, put put an injunction in place that he's not allowed to attend a gathering where there's a lot of wine being drunk does this remind anybody of anything right addicts I don't know if we have any former addicts here on the on, on, on the on the Zoom, but for, but addicts all know that certainly at least for the first year, eventually, obviously, you have to be able to go right. But um, it, it, it's considered it's considered you know bad practice to go to an event. Don't go to a party where they're going to be drinking, right? Because you're you know that you can't handle that, and you have to put in your own fence. You have to put your own fence up. And I, I think we've got enough examples by now, but the point is very very clear. That sometimes it's up to us to put in protective measures in advance to build a fence to separate us, ourselves from something which may actually not be a terrible influence, but that can lead to a bad influence. Um, Marilyn, the Alter Rebbe, the first about Rebbe, elaborates on this in text nine. Teshuvat Hagadir, Teshuva of the fence, means distancing from evil to the greatest degree possible so that one will not be tempted to sin. God forbid. The penitent needs this more than someone who has not sinned. The sages taught one should not say, I am repulsed by the thought of eating meat and milk. I am not repulsed, but what can I do? My father in heaven has decreed upon me. The holy maggot said that this only applies to someone who has never sinned. The penitent, however, must develop a feeling of disgust towards evil or that which is forbidden. So he says, this is repulsive to me, so that he does not fall into it. Thus, someone who has been in a lower place must be extra careful, even after he has come up. So uh, this is a very, very powerful point, okay, Um, to to reemphasize here. In general, our sages tell us that when it comes to, so let's say you're somebody who's never eaten non-kosher in your life, mm-hmm. and you pass by in and out Burger, our sages tell us you shouldn't walk by and pretend, don't, don't, don't be, don't, don't, don't be, uh, no, don't fool yourself. You shouldn't walk, walk by in and out Burger, smell a good cheeseburger, and say, it's disgusting, I can't stand it, don't work yourself up to a place of disgust. You're allowed to say, it smells delicious, but the Torah tells me I'm not allowed to, so if I don't do it. But that attitude is reserved for somebody who that's not his challenge. If that is your challenge, in other words, let's say you've only just recently decided I'm going to keep another law of kosher, or maybe you just jumped up on full board that you're going to keep kosher. You should not only should you not uh, uh, um, um, uh, smell ch- uh, cheeseburgers and, and and be enticed by them, but you actually, as you're driving by, you should try to drive a different direction. 
in order, obviously, not to put yourself in a situation where you'll be tempted. Right? Mm -hmm. And these are the preemptive measures that we have to put in place. Now, ultimately, these preemptive measures, by the way, are all about humility. Why? Because the idea is basically admitting to yourself that this is a temptation. Um, this is the, uh, the fence that you put around yourself. Correct. And, and putting a fence around ourselves really takes a big amount of humility. Why? Because what we need to do is we need to tell ourselves, I have a problem. Meaning, I'm, I'm making these words very extreme, right? But even if it's just a, uh, the, ch the problem that we have is that we have a certain temptation, which is just makes us human, right? I have a human condition. Mm -hmm. And it involves basically uh, uh, admitting to ourselves that we have this temptation and that therefore we have to put up a fence. Most people don't like to do that, right? Naturally, we're arrogant. Naturally, we like to say, ah, I'll manage, right? Mm -hmm. Here's a good example. I I'm going to venture to say that everybody on this Zoom mm -hmm. and really most people mm -hmm. have a temptation to text while driving. Mm -hmm. Most of us get in the car and we say, I don't need to put my phone in the back seat. I just won't text while I'll drive. We start off not texting, right? And then the message comes in and this and that and whatever, and then uh, right, the temptation arises. And hopefully most times where we do have the self-discipline, right? but very often we don't, right? Proper uh, uh, behavior here would be to originally say, look, I have the humility to admit that I might not be, you know, uh, super on top of myself in this, uh, in this regard. I, 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 really, I recognize that I might come to text while driving. I recognize that I might come to eat a cheeseburger. I recognize whatever the example is. And therefore, I'm willing to admit that to myself and put in place a, uh, a, 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 a protective measure. This brings us back to this week's Torah portion. In this week's Torah portion, the Torah tells us, when you build a new house, right? What's the house? The Rebbe explains. What house are we talking about here? Oh. Uh, I think Phil. Phil, please text 10. What house are we talking about here? Sometimes house can refer to a person's body. So it refers to our body, our life, ourselves. In our life, in our body, in our situation, right? When you build a new house, on the roof of the house, so if, if, if our life is our house, then what is the roof of the house? Text 11. Phil, why don't you keep going for us? <clears throat> and you, <clears throat> excuse me, and you shall make a guardrail for your roof. I have found an allusion here. Since a roof is tall, the Torah is alluding to the notion that one should impose limits on his haughtiness. If not, then that will be his downfall. For the one who falls will fall from it, as it is stated. Before destruction comes pride, and before stumbling, a haughty spirit. So if, if our lives are the house, and the roof of the house is the ego, right? What is it that causes a person to fall? Lack of humility, arrogance, excessive pride, self-absorption, complacency, right? These things, me, I'm a tzaddik. I've been a coin god over 80 years. Right? I've, been, I've been praying and davening for 50 years. I'm going to fall? That's the ego. That's the roof. You've gone up on the roof now, and now you're in a dangerous situation. Tells us the Torah, you must make offense. One more, Phil? And you shall make a guardrail for your roof. According to the literal re reading, it should have said, and you shall make a guardrail for its roof, referring to the house that was built. The meaning then is this, make a guardrail for your roof, that is to say, a boundary on your roof, namely on your greatness, that your heart should not be too haughty. Um, was that the whole thing? Yeah. That's all I see. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I want to make sure in my book. That's <laughs> just a double check. <laughs> so thus, the mitzvah of building a fence is not just about building a parapet for your home balcony, right? But it's actually about making sure that in our own lives, we, we, we have to be especially careful with our ego to set limits, put checks in place, to make sure that we put precautions, even if we feel like we're at a great spiritual status, to make sure like Rabbah, we always look at ourselves as like just 50-50. At any moment, my evil side can, can, can jump up because precautions are necessary to stay humble. Um, uh, I'll share a, a, an example I heard once from my uncle. My uncle is a rabbi in South Africa. Okay, Rabbi Yassi Chaiken. And he, he has a health insurance there. I guess it's like a new startup or I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's quite old. It's like 10, 15 years old. And I remember a few years ago, right before my wedding, so I guess five, six years ago, 
I remember seeing him come, I guess the Apple Watch had just come out and he had the Apple Watch. I said, oh, yes, you got the Apple Watch. He goes, actually, you'll never believe it. My insurance company gave it to me for free. I said, really? He goes, yeah, I have this, this funky insur- health insurance company. He says, they gave me the Apple Watch for free. And he said, but the Apple Watch tracks my steps. Right? Does anybody have a, a smartwatch? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. It tracks how many steps you take per day. And I think it's either 10 or 12,000 steps that your average human being is supposed to take per day. And if not, then that leads to obesity if you're sitting, sitting around the whole day, right? That kind of thing. So his, uh, his, so his, um, so his health insurance company told, get, sent him an Apple Watch. I mean, it was probably in a program that he opted into. But, mm-hmm. And they said, listen, we're going to be monitoring how many steps you take every day. And I think he had like five per month. Five, you know, grace days per month. But he was never allowed to go more than five days per month that he would walk less than 12,000 steps or whatever the amount was. In other words, they're trying to get him to be healthy because they have every incentive for him to be healthy like that. They don't have to pay for his <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever yeah, yeah. procedures he's going to Yeah, whatever, whatever the medical bill will be, whatever, I don't know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> heart condition or whatever it is, right? Um, I found that fascinating. What was that? I said, they don't have to pay for his triple bypass. That's right, so triple bypass. Or his, and right. also, per, you know, on, on his part, it, you know, to prevent him from all the suffering. That he oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why he was in. He was totally yeah. in. And actually, he's, he's a fairly healthy fellow. He's not, he's not obese in any way. It, 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 and this was a program available to everybody, right? They had some other ones like that. Whatever, basically, these programs, were basically what they were doing was encouraging the, 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 their client, their, their patient, or whatever, or what, I don't know what it's called, or their insuree, I guess is the word, right? To, to put in place preemptive measures that he should be healthy and that he shouldn't need uh, 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 health procedures, which I thought was an, an amazing, amazing example of setting up such a fence for yourself in advance, because you know, you have the humility to say, this is something I struggle with. This is something that I have a problem with. Um, which leads us to a conversation about something that, I, that, that Hasidus calls bittel. For those of you that are on Facebook, you, might, you may have seen that my plug this week was the Hasidic concept called bittel. The Hasidic concept called bittel is when we say to ourselves, listen, um, there's a certain problem that I can't solve, whatever it is, right? And we recognize that I have certain limitations. And the next step is to recognize that I actually need to somehow let go. Mm -hmm. What we'll call let go and let God. You know, we all have challenges in life, right? Hopefully we work hard and we ace those challenges. We we work through them, we we pass through them, et cetera, right? But then there are certain things that are not challenges. They're just limits that are part of life. Our mortality, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You think about it enough and it starts to become very, very, What's the word? Uh, um, Humbling. Right? Like very like, uh, keeps you in check. Like, you mean I could be the president of the United States, plus the best football player there is in the world, plus a big celebrity, and plus whatever, but yet I'm only going to live X amount of years? And and one day I'm going to die? Like I control so much. Mm -hmm. Right? And yet, we all have things in our lives, right? That we convince ourselves, oh, we're in control. I'm, I'm but this is one of those things that you just can't, right? Or every once in a while, you think, maybe, maybe I'm the only one who does this, right? You start thinking, you start thinking you're very depressed because you realize I'm never going to be able to obtain all the knowledge in the world. I'm never going to be able to fully understand the whole Torah. I'm never going to be able to fully even read my whole library, <laughs> you know? Right. Because there's only so much time that I have to read and so much. I, and it's like very humbling. You go, whoa, you know, there are certain things in my life and no matter how much I like to think I'm in control, these are problems you can't fix. And it's in those moments that we turn to God. In fact, uh, this is why Hashem gives us those limitations in the first place. Um, the Rebbe explains that the reason why Hashem created human beings as flawed, or created the world with certain problems that human beings can't fix, is in order to remind us that every once in a while, we got to look up. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to remind yourself that God is in control. Which is very, very hard sometimes. And as human beings, we like to think, oh, we're conquering COVID. We came up with a vaccine so quickly. And we did it, and we fixed this, we fixed that. And look, there's no polio. There's no, this, this. We forget sometimes that uh, it's not fully in our control. Maybe COVID is an example the other way. That Hashem sent it to remind us that we got to look up every once in a while, right? 
But this is how the Rebbe explains. Phil, go ahead. So there's no creature will ever make the mistake of thinking that they have no need for the creator and the ruler of the world to that which is higher than them. God created them with deficiency in their being, one that they cannot fill themselves. And, and because there's something, uh, hold on, as a result? Well, as a result, they sense that they are dependent on a higher power. This is what's called bittel. Now, some people manage to somehow delude themselves throughout their whole lives and go about their whole lives and never look up, right? They say, I could do everything, and they just ignore the ones that they can't, that they can't take care of. But bittel is a very, very powerful point. And bittel, by the way, helps in a lot of areas. Bittel helps in relationships. Recognizing that we're not in control of everything, recognizing that we're not all, uh, uh, be all end all, is mm-hmm. very very healthy in relationships. To be a good parent, right? Recognizing that it's not all about you; it's about it's about my child. So to be a good spouse, recognizing that you you have to spend some time. I maybe I don't know what my spouse's problem is, and I should let her explain it to me. And then you know, that's called bittel. That's called stepping out of yourself and listening to our spouse, right? And uh, and bittel also helps us in our relationship with God, of course. Right. In fact, really, if we want to make a quantum leap in our relationships, any relationship, recognizing that we are very, very limited is extremely helpful. Marilyn, text 13. The vehicle for any kind of innovation is vital. When one wishes to make a leap to a place that is incomparably greater than his previous station, he must first reach the state of loss and nothingness. Through this, one becomes a vessel for achieving that ascent. You know, I think uh, Marilyn. I think I think we discussed this before. Um, in from from a uh, from a botanical perspective, <laughs> um, I believe <laughs> Marilyn is our resident gardener. Um, <laughs> I believe that at least Chassidus explains that when you put a seed in the ground, one of the first things that happens to the seed is the seed has to decompose. And what happen, has to happen is, if a seed just continues to grow at the same rate that it's, that it's growing, then, then the seed will just be a very, very big seed. In order for the seed to eventually become a tree, what needs to happen is the seed needs to decompose so far that you don't even see the seed anymore. It's no longer a seed. There's nothing there anymore. It's gone. And then out of the nutrients that are born from that decomposed seed, that's where a tree grow, uh, uh, that, that's what a tree grows from. And then it can grow up to be a, a whole new a whole new existence, which is a tree. Similarly, in our lives, any new journey begins with bittel, begins with getting out of ourselves and recognizing that we we have to deteriorate a little bit. We have to get out of our way a little bit. Um, Half of you were were in shul this past week where I spoke about the pursuit of ignorance and the importance of getting out of ourselves in order order, order to become uh, close with God. That's the beginning of any new journey, particularly if we're not just looking to become incrementally closer with God, but to actually become a new existence where we're closer with God, that starts with Bittu. That starts with, uh, with, uh, with, with, um, with getting, getting out of ourselves in order that we can become a new existence. Um, and that's why it says, if you want to build a new house, what's a new house? Um, and, 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 and we're going to add a little technical here with something for a second, and then, then, we'll, then we'll understand. A new house is when you're trying to establish a brand new level in your relationship with God. Um, Bittu is the gateway to those new changes that we want to want to have in life. So that's the answer. When we're starting out on any new journey or, or stage in life, we need to keep boundaries in mind. And any new endeavor, a little Bittu, puts you on firm footing. Okay. Um, we're going to get a little technical now, but I think it'll... it'll, it'll you know what? Actually, let's skip this part because we're running a little, a little later as it is. We have quite a bit left here, so let's just uh, skip 14b. Sorry, 14a and 14b. You know what? Let's let's conclude the lesson. Because this, 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 this would be a little, a little bit much. I want to conclude the lesson with this powerful quote. The, uh, the Shiboli Aleket, who is a much more recent, actually not, not so recent, I'm sorry, my bad, who lived in uh, the 1200s, um, he actually believes, and I don't think the halachas like him, but I think there's a lot to learn this perspective. He says, um, and Arnold, if you can read for us, please.
Arnold? Oh, you said Arnold. I'm sorry. Please. Uh, <laughs> we have learned regardless of uh, regarding other mitzvot, like Ma'ake, uh, Tzitzi, Tzitzit, and Sukkah, that uh, that they may be used in degrading mm -hmm. manner or be trampled upon. So many of you are familiar with the fact that many things um, uh, have a certain holding system, right? So tzitzit, for instance, we don't throw them out, right? If they rip, we put them in Geniza, we put them, they have to be buried properly in a Jewish cemetery, right? In a special section. An etrog, we try to use it when we, when we uh, burn the chametz or a lulav, right? An old etrog, an old, old lulav, we use it when we burn the chametz. The Shibodi Alekhan is actually of the opinion that a mica, in other words, the, the guardrail that you put around your home is such a mitzvah, thank you, uh, is such a mitzvah that is exactly like that. In other words, the fence itself becomes holy and you can't throw it out. Uh -huh. I think this is a very, very powerful thing about this mitzvah. Um, uh, this mitzvah is such a powerful mitzvah because it's not just about physically protecting someone. Anybody ever think about the fact that um, the, just, as, just, as with, just as with all mitzvahs, if you don't have the opportunity to do it, you don't have the opportunity to do it. So imagine if you have a house and your contractor builds a fence. Maybe your contract is considered like you doing it. All right. Your friend sees that, uh, that the fence is dangerous. So he goes up to the roof and he builds a, he builds a guardrail around your roof. You know, the, the Talmud actually talks negatively about somebody like that. Because he, he passed up on the opportunity to do a mitzvah. Even though the negative side will have been accomplished, nobody's going to fall now, right? You won't be, what was it? There, there won't be blood on your hands. But he actually forfeited a chance to do this mitzvah. The reason why this is so powerful and why the Shibole Aleket says that the, the guardrail itself becomes holy is because of the spiritual component of this mitzvah. The spiritual component of the, 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 this mitzvah is that we have to put guardrails in our own lives, on, 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 on whatever preemptive measures against uh, whatever it is that we feel are the things that we're susceptible to. And because that's symbolized by this mitzvah, would you want to let somebody else do it? Of course not. So we'll end off with some questions for reflection. Where in your life do you need to impose boundaries? And why? Why do people struggle with making boundaries? Why do we struggle with making boundaries for ourselves? I think, I think there's a lot of ego involved in that question. Mm -hmm. What's a good way to make boundary setting easier? Because if there's one lesson we take from this week's parasha, it is the Asisa Michael Gagecha that we have to set boundaries in our own lives. Because if we don't do it, nobody will. Nobody will. And that's the only way to connect to God, through Bittal, through having the humility to set boundaries and to, and to, 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 to realize we're, we're not be all end all, but we actually have to allow God in by setting boundaries. L'chaim, l'chaim. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.